Jay here, and in this episode, D, Ben, and I will be playing the new White Dwarf mission Into the Underhive on the Sump Wallboard. This time on JD in the Sump Sea. In White Dwarf 496, there's an article about Mark Bedford's newest terrain project, Ferrostack 125. Mark starts off by talking about how back in the 90s there were several vertical Necromunda dioramas, I assume from the studio, but that people didn't play on them because, well, they were dioramas. So he wanted to change all that, so he started by making some plans on how the board would be constructed. He wanted several distinct sections and an ability for the minis to climb up and down, so he had to account for that. He also talks about the actual construction of the board, what materials were used, and what paints were used. The article is quite inspirational, and this is the kind of Necromunda content that I want to see in White Dwarf. But what's great about this article is that we're not done. On the next page is the scenario, Into the Underhive. There's also a box about playing on vertical battlefields. So let's take a closer look at this scenario. Looking at the scenario, we see that each player starts with custom selection 9 for their crew size, but then you split that set of 9 into 3 groups of 3. The groups of 3 fighters are then deployed within 2 inches of a door. Each player picks 2 tactics cards, and the battle ends when there are no loot tokens left or if there is only one gang with any fighters left on the battlefield. The victory goes to the player with the most loot. There are rewards also, but today we were playing a skirmish game, so those rewards weren't that relevant to the game we played. There are two special rule sections for this scenario, if it ain't nailed down and winding tunnels. If it ain't nailed down describes how the loot is gathered. For each level of the battlefield, a loot casket is placed, and then a D3 is rolled for each casket. That number on the D3 is how many loot tokens are placed next to the casket. In a fighter's turn, they can perform a loot basic action to pick up a loot token. The winding tunnel rules describe where the loot tokens can be taken. The scenario says to designate six tunnel entrances and number them one to six. During a fighter's activation, they can perform a tunnel crawl basic action if they're within two inches of a tunnel entrance. They are then removed from the battlefield along with the loot token and that is how you count how many loot tokens are taken for the gang. In the end step, the fighter can come back onto the battlefield within two inches of a random tunnel entrance. The final inset box on the page talks about playing on vertical battlefields, and how the one side is presumed to be closed, like the roof of a Zone Mortalis board. Our board is not set up like Mark Bedford's board in the magazine, and we had three players, so we had to do some modifications to the scenario rules. We kept the idea of random tunnels, but instead of having only six, we counted all of the doors as entry points, and all of the ventilation ducts and pipes as exit points. To randomly determine where our three groups of three fighters would deploy, we rolled a d10, re-rolling the zero result. This would tell us which one foot section of wall we could deploy on, and then we picked the actual door that group would come out of. We had eight loot crates that we took turns placing on the board before deployment was determined and we decided that those crates would be the only objectives instead of each crate producing D3 loot tokens as the scenario suggests. And finally we decided that our sump wall board was exactly how it looked. One side was indeed a wall and the other side was open. Someone could fall, get knocked back, or hurled into the sump and, using the rules from the Book of Peril, drown with a failed strength check. When placing objectives, in this case loot crates, we always try to place them a good distance from each other, and also to space them out across the board. At this stage, none of us know where we are deploying, and we also don't know who's going first, so this spacing of objectives helps ensure a more fun game where no one should have too much of an advantage. The three gangs are my Steve Bennett's Sump Pirate Outcast Gang, Ben's Sump Pirate Outcast Gang, and Dee's Van Sars. And with the objectives placed, we're now ready to begin deploying. 
We each roll a d6 and Ben gets the highest roll. I get the next highest roll and D rolls the lowest. Ben deploys three fighters at the huge sump wall gate door. I deploy three up top on the newest piece of terrain, the sump wall settlement. D deploys a sky cutter in the sump. Ben places three more pirates at the far end of the board. I place my captain, Steve Bennett, near the middle of the board right next to the sump wall settlement tile. D places three more Vansar not far away from the sky cutter. Ben places his sump captain right in the middle of the sump wall settlement. I place my ogre and two other fighters way up high and on the left side of the board. D places his final four fighters up high, just a few inches from my grenade launcher champion and his ogre and buddy. Chris, Chris said Spamuel. This does not mean I'm not a meat hit neck anymore. It's time for turn one. Ben goes first, followed by D, and then myself last. So Ben starts things off by firing his captain's auxiliary harpoon launcher at my sump captain, Steve Bennett. It hits, and he drags Steve right off the edge of the platform he was standing on, and he falls almost into the sump. The fall inflicts a flesh wound on my captain, and it's then time for some retaliation. Or so I thought. And I miss. D then flies his sky cutter up to try and get as close to a loot crate as possible. Ben moves one of his pirates and gets right next to the loot crate. I move my sump pirate, Bosch Braziliano, and line up a shot with his auto gun onto one of these Vansar. Bosch pins the Vansar and inflicts a flesh wound. The Vansar stands up and fires back, pinning Bosch, but not otherwise hurting him. I'm gonna do a group activation here. That's a champion, but he's got commanding presence, so we're good. Ben then uses commanding presence to activate and move three fighters. One goes straight up an elevator and some stairs. The other goes a different direction, but still ends up taking an elevator and some stairs to get some elevation, no doubt, for lining up shots in future turns. D has a Vansar attempt to jump and fails his initiative. The ganger ends up falling, but not getting injured. I then move Rene Rochefort down a ladder. Rene pulls out his stub gun and fires at Ben's champion. He doesn't do any damage, but does pin him, preventing him from using his harpoon launcher in his next activation. It's Dee's turn again, and he moves one of his Vansar over to a loot crate on the lowest level of the wall. Ben moves one of his pirates closer to a group of Vansar. I then move Fiery Jack over to a ladder, and then down a level. Yeah. Yikes. D then fires his Vansar with the Rad Gun. It's a Flamer template, and only Strength 2, but it causes pinning and has the Rad Phage rule, meaning it will inflict an additional flesh wound on anyone it hits on a 4+. Ben's fighter is hit, not wounded, but gains a flesh wound from Rad Phage nonetheless. Ben then activates a ganger who jumps onto a large pipe of some sort and shoots at Dee's Vansar with his stub gun. He pins the Vansar and then runs out of ammo. My sump pirate, Jean Ducasse, then follows Fiery Jack down the ladder but stays one level above him. Dee fires at Ben's ganger who is right next to a loot crate and pins him. Ben moves one of his gangers and lines up a shot on Dee's ganger with the big gun. He pins him but otherwise doesn't hurt him. I then activate and move Redlegs Greaves, who goes down several flights of stairs trying to get to grips with one of Ben's gangers. D moves a Vansar down a ladder closer to Ben's pinned fighter, who's next to a loot That's crate, cool. and shoots him. Um, I'm going to shoot that guy in the face. Okay. 
at the Zamundi. Then Ben moves a ganger up a ladder and over a long gantry, and it's my turn again. I activate my champion, Bartholomew Roberts, who has a grenade launcher. I fire a crack grenade and hit, but fail to wound one of these gangers. That's nine inches. His ganger then falls nine inches and gets seriously wounded. D shoots a ganger at Ben's ganger, who is up on the pipe. He misses and then runs away. I activate my Ogren, Jolly Roger, and he follows the path Redlegs Greaves took and ends up right behind him. I finally activate my leader, Captain Steve Bennett, the Gentleman Pirate. I stand him up and he just backs into a corner waiting for next turn. In the end phase, D has to roll a recovery test for the ganger who fell, rolls a skull, and takes him out of action. No one bottles. We start turn two. So Ben goes first, then me. Successful. Then Dale. Ben moves his ganger, who is up on the pipe, over to the loot crate. I then activate Captain Steve Bennett and use the Adrenaline Surge Tactics card, giving him the ability to use three actions in one turn instead of two. He climbs up one level as one action, then uses the ladder to go up to the next level as his second action. That'll hit, but it's an ammo check. Uh, I think I'm out of ammo. His third action sees him shooting at Ben's captain, going out of ammo, but still hitting. I used his solid shot ammo, but still didn't wound. Ben's leader is just pinned. D then shoots his rad gun at Ben's leader just to add insult to injury. The template also hits one of Ben's other fighters. He wounds him and takes him out of action, but nothing else of note occurs, and then it's Ben's turn again. Hand flamer. Ben then uses a hand flamer on D's grav cutter. Doesn't wound it, but does set it on fire. I then activate Rene Rochefort, unknowing heir to the Cheese Empire in the Spire, and he attempts to charge Ben's champion. I'm feeling confident because he has a two-handed axe. Unfortunately, he doesn't roll high enough and the charge fails. He's gonna pick up the loot. Yeah. Okay, and then he's gonna disappear out of that tunnel. Ben then fires on the grav cutter again and does another flesh wound. I then activate and move Emmanuel Wynn, and he climbs down a ladder to the bottom of the sump wall and is ready to grab a loot crate next turn. He's gonna move 10 inches off. Yeah, he's pretty much effectively out because I need a six here to put out the fire. Nope. After D's grav cutter flies around erratically trying to put out the fire, Ben activates one of his fighters and attempts to jump a gap. He fails his initiative check and falls, and then goes out of action. I then activate Bartholomew Roberts and fire a crack grenade again at one of D's Vansars. It hits and pins the Vansar and also gives him a serious injury. Ben activates his champion with the harpoon launcher and shoots a stub gun at Renee causing a serious injury. I then activate Redlegs Greaves. He climbs down a ladder and attempts the same jump that Ben's fighter did moments earlier. He falls and takes a serious injury. Deactivates a Vansar fighter and takes the loot crate. Ben then stands up one of his gangers, takes the ladder down to an elevator, and rides that elevator down to the lowest level of the sump wall. I activate my Ogren, Jolly Roger, who then walks over to an elevator, takes it down one level, then moves over to a hole in the floor, ready to take the ladder below it the next turn. D then activated his ganger with the rad cannon and shot at Ben's ganger, who had taken the loot crate. He hits and wounds, causing a serious injury, and then also causes a flesh wound from Radphage. Ben then shoots his captain at D's ganger with the rad gun and pins him. 
I then activate Bosch Braziliano and stand him up and move him towards the other side of the platform. Ben shoots one of his gangers at D's ganger who has the loot crate. He hits, pinning D's ganger. I activate and move Fiery Jack. He climbs down a ladder and uses his hand flamer on Ben's sump captain leader. He doesn't hurt him, but just set him on fire. I then activate and move Jean Ducasse down, so he's standing next to Fiery Jack. In the end step, Dee's fighter who escaped through a tunnel with a loot crate earlier in the turn emerges in a different part of the board. Dee's ganger who was injured rolled a flesh wound in the recovery step, producing his toughness to zero and going out of action. I rolled a flesh wound for Rene Rochefort, and he is no longer seriously wounded. And Redlegs grieves, rolls a serious injury, and goes out of action. Picard? Three! Aha! Two! Maybe Two, one. we roll off. Ah. Six. You go, so Dale, Ben, me. Turn three begins, with D using his rad gun again, but this time on my fighters, Fiery Jack and Jean Ducasse. He doesn't give either of them flesh wounds, but they do both get hit and fall off the platform they were standing on. They fall, get wounded, and both suffer serious injuries. One of Ben's fighters then activates and takes his loot crate with him through a door. I then activate Jolly Roger, who shimmies down a ladder onto the elevator and rides it to the ground level then runs behind some metal columns. D then activates one of his Van Sar fighters and fires at one of Ben's gangers, misses, and then moves forward. Ben then activates his champion, stands him up, and charges Rene Arochefort. He hits Rene four times, wounds Rene four times, and then puts him out of action. I then activate my leader, Steve Bennett, and charge Ben's sump captain leader. Steve Bennett hits four times and wounds three times. His pincer pattern servo claw makes short work of the other captain. Ignoring his armor and then because of the sever special rule, it bypasses the injury die roll and simply takes the other captain out of action. Steve then consolidates back down the stairs. The Vansar with the rad gun is at it again, hitting Fiery Jack and Jean Ducasse again. Jean Ducasse has had enough, and goes out of action. Fire Jack stays there, still seriously wounded. Ben activates his champion next, and shoots and hits. My ganger, Emmanuel Wynn, and wounds him, also causing a flesh wound. Wynn then fails his initiative check, and falls into the sump. I then activate Wynn, and he promptly fails a strength check, going out of action. D then activates the Van Sar and fires at one of Ben's gangers, but misses. Ben then activates that ganger and moves him away from the Vansar and up a level higher on the wall. I activate Bosch Braziliano who grabs the loot crate and carries it through the door. Ben activates another ganger who also backs away from the action. Bartholomew Roberts moves down the staircase and Deve's grav cutter moves randomly due to being on fire closer to the board edge. Did. In the end step, I use the More Where They Came From Tactics card. I rolled a d3 and I get a 1. One fighter who was taken out of action is now able to come back from reserves for the next turn. I don't bottle and neither does D, but Ben bottles and all but one of his fighters flees the battlefield. His last fighter comes back due to the scenario rules and pops out of a door all the way up at the top of the sump wall. And that does it for turn three. That's two lads. Three. Shit. Four. All right. Ben goes first and moves his lone ganger towards the remaining loot crate at the end of the board. I then activate Steve Bennett, my pirate captain, and move him up the steps to get closer to the Van Sar. He then fires and misses. The Van Sar strikes back by shooting him with his rad gun, which pins Steve Bennett, but otherwise leaves him unharmed. 
I then activate my Ogryn, Jolly Roger, and he starts moving up the staircase to try and get the loot crate that is sitting on the stairs above him. D then activates one of his fighters and escapes through a tunnel with it. Bosch Braziliana moves forward onto a small gantry with good lines of sight. Jean Ducasse then moves to a ladder and climbs down one level. D then activates another fighter and moves through the tunnels. I activate Bartholomew Roberts and move him down some stairs and then down a ladder. Fiery Jack then activates and crawls away from the Vansar who shot him. In the end step, my gang bottles, but D's Vansar don't. Fiery Jack runs away, Ben's lone ganger flees, Bosch Braziliano then also flees. Turn! Five! D go first. On turn five, D goes first. He uses the tunnel's rules to good effect, and one of his gangers shows up near my Ogryn and starts pursuing him. The Vansar shoots the Ogryn, pins him, but doesn't wound him. I move my champion Bartholomew Roberts twice. D moves the Vansar over to a loot crate and picks it up. I stand up Steve Bennett and fire at the Vansar with the Laz Carbine, hit, wound, and out of action him. Steve then gets hit again by the Vansar with the Rad Gun. He doesn't get wounded, but does take another flesh wound from the Radphage rule. Jean Ducasse then takes revenge for the captain by shooting that Vansar with a Laz Gun. He then falls off the gantry, takes a wound from the fall, and suffers a flesh wound and takes a wound from the gun and suffers a serious injury. The Ogren Jolly Roger stands up and heads back down the stairs towards the Vansar who shot him. In the end step, D bottles. My champion Bartholomew runs away. The Vansar near the Ogren runs away. Turn six, Steve Bennett stands up and shoots at the Vansar again, but he misses. Jean Ducasse tries shooting the other Vansar, who, who is seriously wounded. He hits, but fails to wound. Jolly Roger turns around and starts walking back up the steps towards the loot crate. On turn 7, the Vansar escape with the loot crate. Steve Bonnet grabs the loot crate. Jolly Roger grabs the loot crate. And Jean Ducasse takes the ladder down. In the end step, the seriously injured Vansar goes out of action. Also in the end step, the Vansar who left with the loot crate reappears way up high from a pipe opening. In turn 8, the Vansar who just popped out of a tunnel fires at Steve Bennett but misses. Steve then hightails it out of a door with a loot crate. Jolly Roger grabs the loot crate and carries it back down the stairs. Jean Ducasse heads down to the door and leaves. In the end step, Steve Bennett emerges from a tunnel way on the other side of the board. Jean Ducasse comes back out of the door he went into moments earlier. He then walks down some stairs. D's last fighter then runs off the board, and the game is over. At the end of the game, D had three loot crates, I had two loot crates, and Ben had one loot crate. I was the only one with fighters on the board, and there were still loot, two loot crates on the board. My Ogryn had one, and the other was never touched. Even though we had to modify the scenario to match our terrain, I think that this scenario was quite fun, and I could see us playing it again in the future. This scenario we played gives us a good set of rules for using all the pipes, air ducts, and doors that D modeled on this board. We've played other games of this terrain, but none was as engaging as this one, and I think that's partly due to the scenario, but also partly due to the large central piece D made, as well as the corner sections. Our previous games that we've played haven't made use of those pieces. When playing on a board like this, as long as one side is open like we played it, taking things like grapnel launchers, drop rigs, and grav chutes seems like a very good idea. Now, none of us built our gangs with those pieces of war gear, but I think we need to really consider that going forward. There was a lot of falling in this game. Well, I'd like to thank Mark Bedford for the great terrain piece he showed us from White Dwarf. It is highly inspirational. And I'm also glad we got to try the new scenario. I thought it was quite fun. 
But that's all I've got for you this time. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.